For Crema Media's Policy, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is political analyst Professor Raymond Satna to discuss his column titled, We Need to Celebrate and Engage Meanings of Human Rights as Part of Recovering Democratic Life. Welcome, Professor. Yes, good morning. Thank you. So, Professor, why do you believe that it's necessary to argue for a pedagogic engagement with human rights? Have others not already done this? Well, I can't remember. If anyone has done it, I don't, or let's say people do. Academics examine socioeconomic rights and things like that. But the media, in my view, most of the time they report that the Human Rights Day was celebrated in Bloemfontein and Cyril Ramaphosa spoke or something like that. And when there are violations, then people do refer to what the law is or what the uh, constitution says about human rights. But what I'm saying is it's more than that. You know, human rights, what they mean is not obvious. Even if you have words saying the people shall govern, I argued in one of the articles, what it means changes at different times. You know, there's a... Um, American, the American Constitution is not as uh, progressive as ours, in my view, but there was a famous um, jurist called Benjamin Cardozo, and he said the great generalities of the American Constitution change from age to age. So what the Freedom Charter means today is different from 1955, even though people treat it like the Bible, which every word is supposed to mean the same. Even the Bible, everyone argues about what it means. You know, my fellow religious people, uh, they all argue about it. So what I'm saying is, you know, there's a set of words. You can give it a meaning that is limited and gives limited freedom, or you can give it a meaning that enhances people's freedom. And what we've seen with the Constitutional Court, especially in the beginning, they actually gave interpretations that increased, enhanced the meaning of social and economic rights, enhanced the meaning of the sanctity of life by abolishing the death penalty. In a sense, they were making law there because they were saying what the right to life means in the Constitution is that the death penalty cannot stand. Those words were not in the Constitution, but it was a very, very important decision. So when, if, for example, uh, people are objecting to the release of Walush, how does that stand when you have the right to life and you're saying you must stay almost till the end of his life in jail. In other words, it's life imprisonment. It's almost like the death penalty. And is that in line with the Constitution? So that uh, on the one hand, when you're celebrating these rights, you must also examine them. But on the other hand, with specific cases, you have to ask yourself, is it humane to interpret it in a particular way? Or what is the way that that would best enhance people's freedoms. Now, I also think people are not very um, uh, involved with the question of human rights. It's a ritual. They just go there. You know, you've got a lot of dates in the calendar. May the 1st is coming up in June 16th, Heritage Day. And a lot of South Africans treat these as long weekends and things like that. That's their main concern with it, that they must book to go somewhere for a long weekend. And I think engagement uh, is will start to make us realize that a lot of people are not enjoying human rights even after 1994. And in some cases, it's worse than before then. I mean, I hate to say that, that under apartheid, some things uh, people did have, which they don't have now. You argue that the meaning of human rights is not static, 
but you place a lot of weight on human rights in the law and the constitution. Does law not need to be precise and have definite meanings and not constantly changing? Yes, well, you know, when you go to court, the uh, you go about the meaning of certain words uh, and you will argue that your client, because of those words, is entitled to these rights or those rights. But those words, as I said, uh, any words must be understood in terms of the conditions of the time. I mentioned in the article that no person ought to go hungry in the 21st century because scientifically uh, agriculture has advanced uh, compared with the 18th and 19th century so that there's enough food for everyone on earth, but they don't get all that food because of the way in which food is distributed commercially and things like that. So that the meaning of um, the right to uh, have a dignified, decent life must include the right to have food. And somehow or other, the state must find a way of providing this because some medication can't be taken if you're not having, you can't live without some food, but you definitely can't take some medication without food. So what I'm saying is you must interpret the human rights in the context of 2023, not in the context of 1996. It's not changed such a lot, but I think we even in this period, there have been a lot of changes like climate change, things like that. I mean, some people like me, when I was studying, I didn't pay attention to climate change. And that was a neglect. But now you can't avoid it. I mean, we we know it wherever we stay, that you one day you don't get water, next day you don't get this, and next day the and the roads are messed up and the weather, you know, uh, you and I were talking about how suddenly winter crept up on us and the seasons are different. Like what the weather is in Cape Town and Johannesburg wasn't like this 30 years ago. True. And Professor, you also refer to the people's power uh, period of the 80s as one of uh, direct democracy, but that it entailed abuses. Are abuses not inevitable in this type of mass democracy that you appear to favor? Yes, you know, people who were in the UDF and in the 1980s are very nostalgic. You know, a lot of people I was seeing yesterday on Twitter or Facebook, someone was saying, why don't they just have people's power again? Now, the thing is, it's can't, you can't re invent the UDF. There was a specific condition in the 1980s. The townships are different. The places where you had people's power in the 1980s, with or without abuses, are not the same as they were in the 1980s. Things that are happening in places that were the centers of people's power, there's xenophobia, there's massive crime, there's killings of people in school grounds, things like this. So there's a social disintegration. Now, in the 1980s, communities were much more united against the apartheid regime. They fought, kicked out the police, they kicked out the Bantu affairs uh, officials and things like that. And they then had a situation where there was no law and order facilities. So they established street committees and things like this, which helped to deal with disputes in the communities. Now, it was uneven. Sometimes there were abuses and there were necklaces and things like this. Now, my understanding is that when they imposed the second state of emergency, especially from 1986 onwards, most of the older people were arrested and the youth tend to be more impatient and to 
believe that you can convert someone to your view when your fists and things like that. I remember we used to have to go and speak to them and say, you can't make someone UDF instead of black consciousness by your fists. You've got to argue with them, explain to them, listen to them, all of this. Now, I'm not saying all youth were like that, but when the older people were there, older people would sit down and they would say, look, you have to build organization, all of that. So when the older people were in jail, and most of the ones who stayed in for a long time in that 1986 to 1990 state of emergency were older people, they would release some of the young people. But also it was a situation where criminal elements could infiltrate. Now, it had happened before. I didn't myself experience that, but I know in some parts of South Africa that was the case. The answer to your question is, if you want to build people's power, and I think it does have a place, because, you know, it, the citizen, the people of South Africa uh, should not just have politics every five years. They have things they can do in their own communities. You know, in the people's power period, sometimes they're making parks and things like this because you know that young people are sitting around unemployed and they don't have recreational facilities. So there's things like that that can be done apart from straight politics. And that can only be done when the whole community is involved. And that was the case, say, in Port Alfred. The women, the unions, the civics, the youth, uh, and a whole lot of others would come together. So they didn't force decisions on the communities to stay away or things like that. But if someone was going to work, a young kid would be in a tree there and say, Mama, where are you going to? It wasn't it wasn't that they'd club her or something like that. That's my evidence that I have from that period. So that it's not something that will be easy to do now, but I think it does have a place. And lastly, Professor, now human rights in South Africa exist in an unequal society. How does inequality impact on human rights? Well, it's very difficult in the sense that when 1994 came, uh, the starting blocks were not the same for everyone. Some of the rights that are in the Bill of Rights were already enjoyed by most whites. Uh, and after uh, 1994, 1996, when the Constitution was adopted, some of the remedies that were introduced, like introducing electricity and water to some areas, um, they didn't, they were, sometimes they were chasing numbers and they didn't do it in a sustainable way. So that, for example, if they built water, put in water, uh, the water pipes, uh, they didn't train people locally in some of these areas to be able to unblock the pipes if they got blocked. And they had to get people from some other part of the province two hours away and and would stay, stay blocked for weeks. Some of these some of these water facilities are not working anymore. Just as electricity, a lot of the numbers that were quoted in the 1990s no longer hold. And the inequality then in uh, the, the formerly white areas, which are still mainly white areas, uh, in those areas, things well, they're not working so well because, I mean, even in Santon, you've got to dodge potholes. But you don't have roads at all in a lot of these areas which have been historically those for black people and remain so. So the inequality uh, is something that's got to be addressed, not just by politicians, but in a broader social economic transformation program from which they are stealing in millions so that a lot of those programs are not working, not just because there's not a will, but because the money put aside for it has been stolen. We know from the State Capture Commission, some of the people who stole, this is what I can't understand properly, some of the people who stole were once very brave and they gave their lives to remedy things that they saw humiliating their parents in that but now 
after 1994, they have become thieves. Not everyone, some of them. That was political analyst Professor Raymond Sadna speaking to Polity about his column titled We Need to Celebrate and Engage Meanings of Human Rights as Part of Recovering Democratic Life.